This week on Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia, Peter Lavelle talks about Ukraine, Russia and the EU. Last week, Ukraine suddenly put on hold its association and free trade deal with the EU. Ever since, there has been a barrage of accusations against Russia, Ukraine's political establishment and Brussels in mainstream media. Lots of finger-pointing and the blame game. Essentially, and for Western pundits, it all boils down to who lost Ukraine, assuming this is even possible. Joining Peter to discuss this and more are, in Voice of Russia's London studio, Sir Michael Arthur, a former senior British diplomat who was the British ambassador to Germany between 2007 and 2010, James Scher, associate fellow of the Russia and Eurasia program at Chatham House, and Alexander Nekrasov, political commentator and former Kremlin troubleshooter. And in Voice of Russia's Moscow studio, Kirill Koktish, associate professor in the political theory department of Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Hello and a warm welcome to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Sir Michael, if I can go to you first. We know that uh, the demand for Yulia Tymoshenko's release has been dropped by the European Union. But can you give us in a few words, and I know this is a complicated story and you're not, we're not getting it in Western media, what is going on in Ukraine? And is Ukraine lost or is it just stuck between the East and the West as it has been for centuries? Well, uh, thanks, Peter, for having, having me on the show. I think your question is, is a very interesting one. Ukraine is, in geostrategic terms, in a very vital part of the world. But I think there's been too much hype in the last couple of weeks over this whole issue of the partnership agreement and the, the trade as the association agreement. I mean, the Europeans have held out this hand, not just to Ukraine, but to others. And uh, it's a very positive step if it can be taken. But if it's not taken now, this is not the end of the world. And I think what has upset me about the whole handling of this is the commentary, uh, I think from the Russian side as much as anywhere, that there's a sort of zero-sum game to be played in mm. the Ukraine. I should hesitate, I should emphasize that I'm no longer working for the British government. So what you hear is my views, not the British government views on this. Okay, Alexander, if I go to you also in London, what I find really interesting is that I don't think the Russians, and, and then maybe this is a point of contention here on this program, that it's a zero-sum game. And Russia has said, why we shouldn't uh, the EU, Ukraine, and Russia sit down and as a trilateral commission and talk about this before any, any signatures for Russia's custom union or for this association to the European Union. But Russell said absolutely no. That is one of their conditions. Is that good diplomacy? I think it's terrible diplomacy. I think that when we heard those comments coming from uh, most Western capitals about uh, Ukraine, you know, like betraying the trust of the EU, I think what we are witnessing is that Ukraine is trying to find the best solution for its national interests. And why should Russia not be doing the same? So I find it very odd. We have statements coming from Brussels and we have statements made in the media which portray Ukraine as somebody, as as a nation who have suddenly betrayed the trust of the world, of the EU, of the civilized world and so on. I think if I was running Ukraine, I would be very, very wary of joining the EU at a time when, when the crisis has not ended, when all those statistics do not really prove that there is a recovery. And that when I see other nations who are not part of the uh, the European Union, like, for example, uh, the Scandinavian countries and um, Iceland, for example, and when I see that in Britain, up to 70% of people want to actually leave the EU, why should I hurry to join it when the ship is sinking? You know, it's, it's, it's a very odd situation when uh, Ukraine is being forced to join a union which is actually not going through a good time, to be honest. Peter, you have to let me come back on that. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, please. No, but I'd like to point out to our listeners just, just some facts right here. Okay? It's just some facts. For Ukraine's signature on this, it was supposed to be this week, they would get 1.6 billion euros over a course of seven years to help mend their economy. Gentlemen and listeners, Ukraine, in the first quarter of next year, has to turn over $10.6 billion in foreign debt. Now, the Russians come around and say, look, I mean, we want to have you in our customs union. We can give you a better deal than that. And Mr. Yunukovych said, hmm, maybe we should think about it. Sir Michael Arthur, please go ahead. Yeah, I was going to make not the short term point about the I mean, who's offering the most for the next uh, time. It's, it's a longer term issue about where the economies of Russia on the one hand and the European Union on the other. 
are going. I mean, the European Union is is the biggest single market in the world, 500 million consumers. I mean, it is clearly one of the driving and growing forces in the 21st century. We've going through a, a difficult time in the end of the financial recession. But then the idea that the European Union is breaking up or sinking is complete nonsense. And I mean, to compare so Ukraine with Iceland is an insult to the Ukraine, in my view. I mean, here is a country of 45 million people with a, with a big economy which needs to grow. And of course, it needs to look to Russia because it's fundamentally uh, got links there on the resource side, which are very important. But equally, it seems to me that the economic imperative is to look westwards as well. And Ukraine needs to find a okay, path. That's, does. We've started this program talking about the condition of the Ukrainian economy and looking east and looking west. And it was brought up in the program that it's been portrayed, Ukraine's decision not to sign the association agreement, as a zero-sum game, meaning Russia versus the EU. But it's the EU that has made it a zero-sum game, one could claim, because it doesn't want Russia's input into Ukraine's economic future. This is the crux of the problem. James, you I, wanted to jump I'm in I'm sorry, there. but um, I, I have to say, quite frankly, I adamantly disagree with you. The, okay, good. In his, recent, the in his recent meetings, the critical meetings that President Yanukovych had with President Putin, Putin outlined for him in frightening detail the measures that Russia would take in response to Ukraine signing the association agreement. And these go well beyond the statutory measures that could be expected that need to be taken in compensation by the Eurasian Customs Union if Ukraine has a free trade area with Europe. These are swinging measures that affect energy and a whole package which was pointed out to Yanukovych, is specifically targeted against the businesses and financial interests that are closest to him and that he relies upon for re-election in 2015. So this was critical, okay, we'll and it, fo about, it follows we'll a we'll, pattern we'll, with we'll, Armenia okay. as well. Okay, Kirill, you've been sitting here next to me in, in Moscow very patiently. Who's turning it into a zero-sum game? Because if Ukraine were to sign the association agreement, it would have to do things for the European Union and redirect its trade, become a market for cheap labor. I can go on and on. So, I mean, again, it's zero sum, depending on which side you look at. Yes, it seems to be a zero sum game from both <laughs> sides. Actually, it's a problem of the harmonization between custom union and European Union because the different level of protection of the internal markets. But actually, now what we do have is that European bureaucracy is saving their own careers, but not European Union per perspectives, not neither Ukraine's perspectives, because what they're doing, it's, uh, the face has been lost. And the game actually has no sense as European Union is not ready to pay. Ukraine needs up to $10 billion uh, only next year. But actually they counted that they would need about $186 billion to harmonize, uh, to adopt the European standards to the Ukrainian economy. So that means that the European proposal of $1 billion is proposal when they counted that European, sorry, that Ukraine industry shouldn't exist because no harmonization <laughs> let, let, me go, let me go back to Sir Michael. It's interesting. We look at what the European Union is offering, what Russia is offering, and James would, would put it in the category of threats. But gentlemen, let's look at another character, another player in this game, and it's called the IMF. And according to the Ukrainian prime minister, he said it was the IMF that, quote, was they were the straw that broke the camel's back when it comes to funding its turnover of debt to the, the IMF. So, I mean, Sir Michael, we have this other player here, and this is a major issue here. Ukraine is broke. The European Union doesn't speak for the IMF, but if you just stand back mm -hmm. and look at a five-year perspective or a 10-year perspective and not a one- or 18-month perspective, 2015 is an important year in Ukraine. Um, uh, of course, there's the debt issue, and many countries across Europe are facing the debt issue and tackling it because in a competitive world, you can't go forward unless you've got that, that result. But look at the scale of the market. I mentioned that point just now, to which Ukraine potentially now has access. 330 million euros of agriculture cultural tariff cuts, uh, re reductions in that in, in tariffs, which are a huge benefit to uh, Ukraine and a growing one over time. And it seems to me when you see all those young people on the streets uh, in Ukraine, they've got that message. And I think the European side has time on its side. It's a pity this is not going to happen as fast as we'd like if it doesn't happen next week, this week. But uh, the, the force of history, I have no doubt, is moving towards uh, a, a larger European market to where the magnetic force of the European Union is far stronger than the magnetic force, natural forces alone, of a resource-based economy like Russia.
We are listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. James, you wanted to jump in there. I want to focus on inside what's going on in Ukraine. And I think a lot of listeners may not be aware of this, but the whole drive, the media drive in Ukraine that from the uh, summer all the way to this week was driven by the party of regions in East Ukraine, the people that actually run Yunukovych, and analysts have claimed, and it seems quite logical to me, that they want to get one of this association agreement so they could clean up their um, their financial dealings. And I'm saying that's a code word for corruption. They want to clean their money and they want to clean up their reputations by being part of European institutions. So it has not much to do with civilization or aspirations, but this is a nice political ploy on their part. There's no question that I think in both cases, and especially in the case of Ukraine, this is a demonstration of how regime interest always wins out over national interest, particularly in the case of Ukraine. Even those Ukrainians who are not in favor of joining Europe understand perfectly well that the absolute for Yanukovych is preserving um, his patrimonial system of power. So that is, of course, that cannot be detached from what he wants from Europe, and he's doing his best to implement pro forma uh, every condition put to him, and preserving as much as what he has so he can carry on, and particularly win the 2015 election. But at the same time, there is no denying that this Ukrainian president, who is the most pro-Russian president that Ukraine has had since independence, is deeply frightened by the prospect of reintegration with Russia, and he also knows that if he embarked on that road, he risks an internal situation that he would not be able to manage. Okay, Alexander, the most pro-Russian uh, president that we've had in Ukraine, on a daily basis, watching the relationship between Ukraine and Russia, you wouldn't get that impression that Yanukovych is very pro-Russian whatsoever. I mean, the sparks are every single day over every single industry, sector of the economy, prices. No, Yanukovych is the representative of the party of regions in the east of Ukraine. That's who he is run by. And his pro-Russianness, well, I think that's like saying, you know, Yulia Tumashenko is the West's angel. Well, first of all, Peter, you probably noticed that two of my guests here, or our guests, uh, were talking about blackmail and pressure from Russia. And that is a Cold War cliche, which, 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 which surfaces all the time in such debates. Because whenever Russia wants to get a better deal, it's blackmail. Whenever the West wants a better mm. deal, this is democracy in action. This is a wonderful potential for the future. That doesn't work like that anymore. Uh, we will not fall for this. And especially when people start talking, for example, that the regime in Ukraine, it's always a regime, isn't it? It's never a Cameron regime, which mm. was never elected, by the way. They are regimes all over the place. They are not working for the people anymore. If you look at the European Union generally, this is about political elites struggling to stay in power, to save the euro and to save the federal European project, which, by the way, is illegal in its essence because it was created as a trading union, as a trade for the trade and economy links. It was never supposed to be a political union. This is a con, by the way. And that is why okay, so right, many right, people right, in Britain right, want Alex, to leave but, it. But Alexander, we're just talking about a trade association right here. Kirill, you want to jump in. Go ahead. Yes, yes. One more point. Just that he, he actually, Yanukovych never was pro-Russian. He was pro-Ukrainian because uh, actually Ukra the structure of Ukrainian economy is very competitive to Russian economy. So that means that uh, Ukraine has to compete to Russia over all, all the most important spheres of its own economy. So Yanukovych just reflects the Ukrainian needs and actually well what, Kirill, what, no, actually, let's, let's what, be actually fair. I think Ukraine... it's be fair here and Yanukovych is reflecting upon his interests because he wants to be re-elected in 2015 and he's taking a break here and yes, it looks yes. like he's going to start this negotiation game all over again yes yes so, so Michael as, as, do you want to reflect Ukraine on that in between. because yes. you know it's you know it, it is a lot about Yanukovych because I get the impression the EU wants Ukraine but it doesn't want Yanukovych Russia also wants to have Ukraine as part of its customs union, but it's not particularly overwhelmed with Mr. Yunuko, which I have to disagree with the characterization that, you know, he's the most pro-Russian president Ukraine's had. Go ahead, Sir Michael. Well, I mean, the first thing is the way this has come out in public uh, perceptions, uh, I didn't use the word blackmail, but somebody suggested I did, and that's not true, but the way this has come out in public perceptions seems to me that Russia is not reassuring its other partners and friends that this is uh, a comfortable way to go forward. I mean, I just leave that as a comment, but is if you wanted to win okay. friends 
friends and allies in your Eurasian community, would you handle it like this? Uh, I wouldn't. Um, the core of this, seems to me, is the juxtaposition of an 18-month timetable of domestic politics in the Ukraine and a decade-long question about how the Ukrainian economy and politics will evolve and where it positions itself in that interesting space we discussed at the beginning of the programme between Russia and the Western European Union. Uh, Alexander mentioned earlier that it was being joining the European Union, being forced to join the European Union. Nothing could be further than the truth. There's no forcing and they're not joining. They're being offered a fantastic market opening deal that is a better offer than many other countries have had. Uh, if they turn it down, right. that's bad James, luck on Ukraine. Is, Ukraine. It, is it such a great deal, James? In the short term, no. And to uh, in large measure, the current authorities are fundamentally at fault because they are determined not to institute the kind of changes in the way the economy works that would enable them to take full advantage of this and quite quickly. Uh, but the point is, and someone mentioned this earlier, Yanukovych is not forever. This deal is being looked at over the long term as far as its wider benefits for Ukraine, which is evolving. And the people who understand what these EU standards are will be immeasurably strengthened by this change of status and this free trade area. And that's the only real motivation behind those in the EU who have been insisting upon the present terms. Now, just one more point, if I may. If the EU did look at it in zero-sum terms, we would be getting into this whole auctioning process, and we would be offering Ukraine extra funds, which is what they're now asking for $20 billion. We've politely said no. We're sticking to the present terms being on the table, and that includes some money from the IMF with conditionality. Conditionality, very true. Absolutely. Alexander, if I can go to you, it seems to me, we go back to the Orange Revolution and its collapse, I would say. Again, if we look at inside Ukraine looking out, there's, this is again dividing the country or showing the divisions more rather of the country because there's plenty of people, Russian-speaking people, ethnic Russians in eastern Ukraine that do not feel this need to move towards the West and look to the West because if, they're, if it's going to be either or, those people will make their choice and it will be looking east. Well, I think you're right here because I think that we always forget about the people who don't really want to be part of Western Europe or the, the EU because they share different values, they have different ideals, and uh, I, I would say that they have a very bad example of the Baltics joining the EU with prices going through the roof, unemployment growing, and I have met a lot of uh, people from the Baltics who came to Britain. They told me of absolutely horrendous stories about this so-called joining of the EU and benefiting from it. Yes, the politicians always benefit. That's the game. But the population usually loses out. And that is why many Ukrainians who have either friends or relatives in the Baltics and by the way, Bulgaria is another example where those protests are going on, not just against corruption as per se, but they're going against the EU as well, because that is the problem that everyone forgets. Politicians always benefit, the population always loses. Now, when people see that, they see what is happening, gangster economics in the EU, they understand that is not a good deal. Ukrainians said to me, we've been with Russia for a thousand years. These new guys from the West, what are they going to offer us? Oh, I think many, many Ukrainians are very wary. You're listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. Sir Michael, go ahead. I Sir just Michael, wanted to please. pick up on one point that Alexander said about the Baltic countries. I mean, they went through a painful transition from a state-run economy at a time of world recession anyway to a market economy integrated into the European Union. And that was painful. I'm the first to recognize that. I have never met anybody from the Balts who wants to leave the European Union and rejoin some former Soviet Union type of structure. So I, I just don't get what Alexander is saying. Your opinion is a Soviet type structure, excuse me, but that is a US, classical USSR. The European Union, Peter, well. is a federal state based on the principles of the former Soviet Union. Single currency, unelected leadership, ruling everything. How can we call the European oh. Union a okay. fair union of equal states? It's amazing what I'm hearing here. Okay. After especially uh, the, I, when I, small I, nations were dragged into austerity I, I, by the big players. And the United States fits that pattern okay. too, perhaps? The United States okay, is completely fine. different gentlemen, gentlemen, I want to go to Kirill here. Wait, what I find really interesting, and I'm glad it was mentioned, this Soviet Union-like. I'd like to stress that I visited the Soviet Union, that Kirill sitting next to me, born in the Soviet Union. Alexander, I imagine you were too. In 2013, 
no one in this country that I've met wants to go back to those days, and no Russian does, because the Soviet Union was a net drag on Russia. Russia paid for way too much, and now, like him or dislike him, Mr. Putin is very hard-nosed, and he wants a good deal. And I think that's what most people want r- Russian leaders to do when it comes to the global economy. Kirill- okay, uh, just the Ukrainian uh, usual policy is not east or west, but the policy is to balance between a large east and last west. And big east and big west, like all the eastern Europe did for the last 300 years. Actually, uh, look at the Baltic states, look at Poland, look at Belarus, look at Romania and Bulgaria. They are balancing and those countries that lost this game, they lost their economy. James, Because the main benefit that Ukraine it, uh, can get under this deal is to, to get its economy disassembled for the spare parts before any benefits would be given to it. James, I was a very big fan of yours during the Orange Revolution and those Unlike months today. afterwards. Because I thought you were... <laughs> well, Unlike no, today. no, it's yes, probably right. not. But I remember you talking about this balancing and how to keep the mm. country together mm. and not making it such a zero-sum game. Mm-hmm. And I, I appreciated that. Do you want to elaborate on what Well, Kirill I think Ukraine is balanced, uh, and it's absolutely right, I don't disagree with what Kirill said, but Ukraine is balanced because it's had to. And even Leonid mm-hmm. Kuchma was quite clear that the purpose of maintaining what he called the multi-vector policy was to gradually create conditions where Ukraine could move westward with Russia's consent. Agreed. By, not delighting Russia, but with Russia's consent, and that required a number of different variables, which for a while he was managing very well. And, you know, for reasons we don't have time to discuss in two minutes, uh, his successors ma- have managed them less well. Let me just try to strike a note of consensus. Um, instead of saying Yanukovych was is Ukraine's most pro-Russian president since independence, Let me say instead, I think it's more accurate, he's his least anti-Russian president since independence. Okay, agreed, right. agreed. Alexander, jump in, go ahead. Right. Well, I, I'm still, see, the reason why I'm looking at the European Union rather than at Ukraine itself and its relations with Russia is because I'm trying to paint a picture of what Ukraine is being offered. And that is why I actually met one of the Ukrainian ministers about 10 days ago, and I asked him questions about, you know, what what, what was the point of that, uh, of your policy? What are you actually trying to achieve? And what I got out of him is that, first of all, there was no good deal on the table coming from the EU. There was no deal practically. So why should Ukraine actually go in closing its eyes just for the sake of democracy and all that other stuff, which are lacking, by the way, in many European countries now? And um, also... I find it very strange that every time there is an economic debate or issue or negotiations, the West tries to accuse Russia of resorting to methods which go back to the Soviet times. I always find it very weird. Every nation in Europe and across the world has its national interests to look after. And why on earth should Russia sacrifice its interests for the sake of looking good in some Western newspapers in the morning? Why should it not fight for its interests? Its interests. And uh, as regards Yanukovych supposedly playing political games because of the election coming, well, let me tell you something. In the West, Western Europe, politicians play even weirder games when elections are approaching. We have David Cameron going against the uh, immigration now and, and saying that he'll cap the interests of payday lenders who are basically legalized loan sharks. He never said that before, but the election is approaching. By the way, roughly in the same period as Mr. Yanukovych will have won. And to say that the Ukrainian president is now maneuvering because of the elections and doesn't care about anything else, this is childish. This is, again, stereotypes which should be forgotten. We should start talking in the new terms and stop this propaganda because Western Europe has been doing a lot of propaganda with Ukraine. And if you look at the so-called crowds, crowds in Kiev protesting, they are not big crowds. They are not big crowds. They could not even get 10,000 on the big day. They couldn't. And when you see the footage okay, so, so. of the Western media, you would see that it's a, not a big crowd. That is very important to understand. Mm-hmm. You should look at those small things which talk about big things. Sir Michael, Ukraine hasn't signed the customs union agreement with Russia. And that's going to be discussed over the next few months. Do you think, considering what we've had to say about balancing here, is that do you think it's possible after the European Union stops brooding about this because it had some quite angry words when Yanukovych said no, 
And his government said no. Do you think now the next step is when things cool down and cooler heads prevail that Russia, Ukraine and the EU can sit down and, and start talking about mutual interests where everyone's a winner? Is that possible? I think it's inevitable. There are sharp words when you're leading up to something and somebody uh, does a U-turn and that upsets the apple cart a bit. But this is a long process, as I've said earlier on this program. Mm. And I don't feel that the European Union is in any way on the defensive or on the back foot about this. I mean, the offer is on the table, will stay on the table. Ukraine, in my judgment, will at some stage find a way to take it up because it's in Ukraine own interest to do that. And in contrast to what Alexander's just said, I'm glad you raised the issue of demonstrations because we've been speaking half an hour with nobody yet mentioning what's happening on the streets. Um, I don't read those demonstrations as, as um, minimalist and as unimportant as he does. I was in Germany, in Berlin, two days ago. Certainly in Berlin, that's not the view they take either. They think this is quite an important demonstration of the opinion well, of particularly younger people. <laughs> you know, James, Peter, um, just, um, Peter, uh, just, an, uh, just on go ahead, this please, point, sir. that Russia never invited the EU to the table when it is discussed the terms of the customs union with Belarus or with Kazakhstan, and why on earth should they? The EU has never invited someone outside the process to participate in negotiations about association with the EU. To come back oh, to well, what Sir it, Michael has said, this is all about back. Ukraine's own following, its own national interest, it's up to them, which is why the EU is not changing its terms now. It's up to and that's, them. And that's why, because of the rigidity of the EU, that's why Yunukovych apparently said no. This is what I'm getting at, gentlemen. We've talked about balancing, looking east and west, finding its own way. Well, apparently, after this program so far, that's very difficult for Ukraine. So maybe you have to get creative. Kirill, you want to go? Under current circumstances, elites are playing game, but not uh, nations, not countries. Uh, from one side, by dropping the Tymoshenko demand, European Union bureaucrats saving their own careers. From other side, Yanukovych think about actually he's thinking about his presidential career and he assures that if he signs an agreement now, he would definitely get the drop and uh, in economy and he will lost the presidential election but now with one year of bargaining ahead he is sure that he could bargain a good deal both uh, either with European Union either with Russia either with both of them okay so Michael what's the next six months what's the next year as we lead up to the election here because Ukraine doesn't have a customs agreement with with Russia and it doesn't have an association agreement with the EU so where does it stand well I think that's uh, an issue for the president to to decide I mean, he has chosen to put himself where he is and he will manage that as he sees best. In my view, there's been, as I've said already, that there's a, the medium term drift of history is towards a greater Euro, uh, Ukrainian engagement with the landmass of Western Europe and its economy. I mean, what happens in the next 18 months may be a backward step on that long term road. But unless Ukraine really wants to implode and uh, go down economically over a decade, it's got to find a way to embrace that European economy. Okay, James, you're going to get the last word on this program, uh, James. Go I ahead. just want to disabuse Russian guests here and say that no EU bureaucrat or official, no one's career is being threatened by this. It is remarkable that in the teeth of the financial crisis of huge problems with migration and uh, everything else that uh, this has been kept on the road. Uh, most people in Europe are neither bothered by it nor terribly conscious of it. All right, gentlemen, we've run out of time. One thing I can assure all of you and our listeners, Ukraine isn't going east, it's not going west, it's staying exactly where it is. You've been listening to Voice of Russia's political discussion program, Debating Russia. I'm Peter Lavelle. I want to thank my guests, Sir Michael, James, Alexander, and Kirill here in Moscow. Stay with VOR.